<laughs> and I have to do the clap. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Cloud Architects. It's been a while since I've been around, but uh, it's super good to be back. I'm here with my friends, Nicholas Blank. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Warren and Chris Goosen. Hello. Yeah, we've definitely missed Warren. So if you're wondering why the intro voice is a little bit different, well, it's because Warren's back today. Warren's Jeez, back. It's been a long time, and I'm super proud to be back. I think uh, work has been a bit crazy, but um, I think we found some time to slot this one in. And also, we've got a super interesting discussion today. Super happy to have Meryl on today's podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself, Meryl? Mr. Meryl Fernando, the Principal Product Manager of Microsoft Authentication. No, I'm kidding. Of Microsoft Enter. <laughs> Hey, hi folks, uh, Meryl Fernando here. I'm, uh, as uh, Warren said, I'm a product manager in the Microsoft Entra team. Um, my role is a customer experience product manager. So I work very closely with customers and sort of be the bridge uh, and the voice of the customer in the product team. Uh, so we have a few of us who work directly with the engineering and I'm here to talk all about Microsoft Entra. And I'd say any we questions. Love yeah. intro. We and love I, I will intro. say, Meryl, I think your your uh your reputation and your fame yeah. precede you, right? I think there's not anyone here, and I'm sure everyone listening, if you are if you're on Twitter, because I, I refuse to call it X, I'm sorry. Uh if you're on or, Twitter um, and <laughs> and you actually follow um anything to do with Enter ID, formerly Azure AD, uh, then you will no doubt have seen um the incredible posts and the incredible content that, yeah. that Meryl puts together and puts out there, right? Yeah, on LinkedIn yeah. as well. Um, I, I myself have learned tons from it. So yeah, super, super happy to to, to have you um, join us, Meryl. Awesome. Yeah, that's great to know. And that's what I want to do to educate people. And I know everyone's very busy. So trying to give small nuggets of information wherever I can. If I may. An example I... of that is the, the newsletter. Hey. Yes. The yes. newsletter is new, though. The newsletter is like new, new. I mean, how long has the newsletter been happening? Yeah, it's, so it, it was funny. I just had the idea over the weekend. I mean, we, we launched Entra, um, Microsoft Entra in June, this mm -hmm. early, early la last year. And I just thought it'd be nice to have a newsletter, like lots of people talking about Microsoft Entra, now that we're no longer calling it Azure AD. And um, I searched, found the domain was free, intra.news. And I thought, yes, this is a good way to start that. And it's more, I, I did this more for the community because there are lots of really great um, authors, contributors, writing toolkits, writing blog posts. There are podcasts like yours that feature intra um, on, on you know different episodes. And I wanted like a single place for mm. ID, IA, like identity and like the Microsoft 365 admins to go. So in my previous past life, I used to be an M365 admin for about mm. eight, 10 years um, managing an enterprise. And I always think like, what would that Merrill want? And I put my shoes in, in yeah, put myself in the admin shoes and mm. try to say, okay, a newsletter would be nice, you know, like a summary of everything. I don't need to go reading a hundred different like, or following so many people on Twitter to just get that condensed. That's lovely. That's wonderful. And, and we love the effort. And thank you on behalf of the community and, of course, us. Thank you. I'd like to delve into Meryl, the human being, for a second and ask you three questions which would explain an awful lot about you, which is... <laughs> Why? I'd, I'd be scared of these. <laughs> <laughs> why Australia? Why Microsoft? And why Intra? Why Australia is interesting. So I'm from Sri Lanka originally. I was born there, um, and uh, I love it. It's a it's a beautiful island. It's an island life. We take things really easy uh, because uh, we, for example, we have. You know, the full moon day, we call mm. it a Poya day in Sri Lanka. And you have one every month and it's a public holiday. Nice. So it's like every year when the calendar comes up, we just go, oh, when, when do we have the holidays? And, you know, when is it, when is there a long weekend? Um, it's always very exciting because it, it changes based on the lunar cycle. 
Um, and I really loved that sort of lifestyle. And when people talked about going on vacation for like, uh, you know, two weeks, three weeks, it didn't make sense to us in Sri Lanka because we have like breaks in between, like almost every month we'd have a like a long weekend. <laughs> and, um, it yeah. didn't um, make sense. But after coming to Australia, I sort of understood why you needed, <laughs> we need to take this because in Australia, like from, I think after May or June till November, we don't have any public holidays. So mm. it's like a whole stretch um, where you go without break. But yeah, Australia, I uh, chose it, picked it because uh, it always sounded very exotic. I mean, I'm from Sri Lanka, but Australia was even more exotic with all of the different wildlife. Um, and uh, I've seen people. It was uh, an amazing culture as well. So I just... We just picked it, my wife and I, and said, uh, "Let's mm. let's try it out." So that's how we ended up in Australia back in two thousand six mm -hmm. uh, when I moved here. Um, Microsoft. Uh, it was. It's an interesting story. So I worked with my previous manager, um, uh, Ben Wolf, when I was working for Telstra. That's my like where I used to work before, mm -hmm. and. Uh, this role came up. I wasn't really sure what this meant. Um, so I didn't really follow up. But then he found out that I was interested. And he called me up and said, you you should apply for this. And he spent, uh, like, it's it's the total opposite. He spent, like, half an hour convincing me why I should join Microsoft <laughs> and, and join this role. And um, I'm glad he did. This is sort of a dream role for me, a, a mm. dream job. I pinch myself every day, um, thinking like I'm, I get to have so much fun. It doesn't feel like work, um, and uh, it's uh, like I wouldn't trade this for any other role that I've so been I in. Think I, I, think, I think I'm in the wrong side of Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> Warren, you're not you're not supposed to admit that publicly. <laughs> it's like, oh, being a PPM sounds fun. <laughs> no, I'm yes, kidding. The, I, the I, know, I I agree with you. I do. Yeah, it's it's an awesome like company culture, but and especially in the Microsoft Entra team in CXC where I am in, um, it's amazing. We're given a lot of uh, room to grow, expand, and do what we have. I like my CVP's ethos. He says uh, his one is is like forget about everything. This is the one thing you need to remember: do the right thing by the customer, by the partners and team, mm. and by Microsoft. Like mm. as long as whatever I'm doing aligns with that. I'm good. So it's it's an awesome um, vision and thing to have. Uh, and it plays out in, like, you can see the results <laughs> from Microsoft Entra as a whole and, and what we do as, uh, as a customer-connected product. How many, how many users do you think are on Entra in total? And now when I say that, I mean, like, in total. I'm including B2C tenants. Um, I'm including, like, Xbox, right? They yeah. say, like, yeah, I'm including like Hotmail accounts and things like that. So yeah. any like backend authentication that happens as far as Microsoft's concerned is definitely using Entra in the background, right? So mm, yes. how many users do you think that actually is? So we, we have think a stat. I, yeah, it is in the billions. So we have a stat. Oh. Uh, it's in the billions because, yeah, every time you have a Windows, every Windows now has Microsoft plugin, right? So personal devices, yeah. Yeah, yeah. devices, True. Uh, Xbox, any Microsoft. So if you just do that itself, it's quite huge. Um, and it's like, I think we get some trillion signals a day from like, you know, the, uh, wow, that's different. mental. That's it's mental. amazing. I was just telling another person, like, but everything's fine. Everyone's happy. But the moment, <laughs> There's a blip <laughs> start in there trying one of the logins. That's when, uh, like, the whole, yeah. like, what's happening? Pe people only notice when it's broken. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, oh, I mean, I guess my question right. is do you have any telemetry on how many folks are calling it Entra ID versus how many folks are calling it Azure ID <laughs> at this point? <laughs> I'd be curious to see that. Uh, <laughs> It will be interesting. Even I catch myself. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, I, why, on it's why Entra as well? Uh, would you do, would you know? Like, do you know why they called it Entra? Is it like short for entrance or 
Like, was it yes, something so yeah. you really? enter it's like a gate? I mean, we when we first launched, we had this door and was part of that whole thing. Like, because you enter through that, right? It's we you don't just use Azure AD or Intra for Intra mm. sake. You you are going somewhere, right? You're going to an app. Okay. You're going to some service. And That's we fair. are sort of the front door. I love to it. Let you in. That's so cool. That's so it cool. Is, oh, we are allowed to ask what's in the back end. So you've got billions of objects. And we know that Active Directory that we know and love, and it's getting a little bit long in the tooth, even though this server 2025, and we're going to have GPOs until 2035 at least. On-prem's but... going nowhere, dude. Yeah. I, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm, I'm still talking about NTLM and how to switch it off or, or trying to, right? But are you allowed to say what's in the back end? Is it SQL? I mean, how do you how do you create a directory, a globally replicated directory that spans billions yeah. and trillions? Yes. Yeah. So we do. We have a really good YouTube architecture series. I can share that. That goes mm. into how we architected how we run at scale, how the like the different data centers uh, run. Um, Cosmos, and maybe. which data. <laughs> Definitely not Cosmos. Um, not it Cosmos. needs to be like okay, really fine. low latency, right? In terms of mm. the performance. Mm. And I don't think Cosmos was there. When, uh, I don't think it even existed when no. Entry ID was stood up, right? Because um, like when it, for Office 365 to be born, it had to have an authentication. And yes. it was initially... That's where um, Azure AD started uh, before evolving into Intra. And, and was it AD in the beginning? I think it was sort of that having that commonality, right? Like I, I don't know the, the the real answer, but it was more around we have on-prem AD. It's mm. a sort of the closest way to say it's a directory service. Mm. Um, and that's how it started. Everything used to be... I think even before Azure AD, it used to be Windows Azure AD because yes. we had Windows. Mm. <laughs> it, it wasn't Azure on its own, right? It was always Windows Azure. And if you remember the name, it was W-A-A-D. Like mm -hmm. that was the prefix they had. So um, yeah, the names evolved, right? We dropped Windows, went to Azure. And now um, it's Entra because we wanted to... And there was, we also have Reorg. So we are whole, there's a whole Microsoft security now because... Uh, Azure AD used to live under Azure, mm -hmm. and uh, we now have all of the security products consolidated into like one org and working, trying to make things better together. And is that where the Copilot integration then would start to come in? Like, look, I think it would be terrible of us as cloud architects to not talk about AI at some point, right? So <laughs> if I had to ask, I mean, with the the integration of AGI now into Intra, like how have you found that? What holes is it filling? Like where does a co-pilot fit into Intra? I mean, does that, is that like, you know, is it like the security co-pilot where we go and we ask it a question, we say, how secure is my organization? They say, well, you haven't turned on multi-factor authentication over here. You should have conditional access over there or whatever the case may be. Like, where does, how have you found that integration and are people actually using it? I mean, so we haven't, like we've shared bits and pieces. It's still a lot of the things are still being built. Um, mm. We've shown how it works. Uh, we have, uh, folks testing it and so on. Um, but yeah, it's like from what we've shown publicly, it's uh, it sort of brings the whole story together, right? Like all of security, mm. you just go to one place. You don't need to think about the different portals you need to go to. And that's a challenge. Mm. And um, one of my toolkits that I've created is cmd.ms. I don't know if any of you. Yes, know yes, we love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. So um, it, it's it's quite complex, right? The security portal is where you need to go and uh, do that. And this will be like a one-stop place to go and ask questions. And uh, it's it's going to be a lot, like it's going to pull things in with the different skills. Uh, there's a lot it will evolve and grow. Like it's, it's going to be a very exciting space over the next few years. Yeah, I've used I've used the Azure Copilot in preview, and man, there's stuff that is in there you thought you wouldn't use, but you do. 
I mean, yeah. you can ask it questions like just like, what are my top three most expensive resources in my tenant? And I'll bring them to you. Or you can be like, create me a bicep template for that, please. And it does it. Or even create me a Terraform template for that. And it does that too. I mean, it, I, I was super impressed. I, I was, I got lost in it for about three or four hours. Um, I should I ask it if I'm going to be, will I receive an unexpected <laughs> bill this month? Because I seem to uh, every month <laughs> receive unexpected bills from stuff. <laughs> like I go and lab out something for a customer and then yes. I forget to disable it, delete it, turn it off or whatever. And then, you know, three weeks later, all of a sudden my credit yeah, card hurts because... Uh, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so yes, that'll be helpful. You know, we've got so many policies um, internally now. I mean, like <clears throat> there's so much... Um, compliance around that and stuff there's frameworks around that that we've built mm. internally to stop that from actually happening you would think that as a microsoft employee you would be allowed to spend a lot on azure but you actually can't because it's so heavily locked down and so you should probably just take some of those things and you could be like okay well anything that i deploy in this subscription <laughs> it's there for longer than three days trash it because mm. i don't need it i probably mm. just forgot about it you know <clears throat> you just rebuild it or whatever the case would be is so we've done a lot of that internally because i can almost guarantee you there's been a couple of ftes that have gone <laughs> and left m series running for a month mm -hmm. and been like mm. you know warren um, can you do yeah. a what is my resultant set of policy with copilot so that yeah. i know yeah, what yeah. I'm, I'm actually able to do hey copilot tell me what i'm able to do yeah uh you can you can do a result instead of, and it's becoming a bit of an issue. And I think perhaps this is a question for you, Merrill, as well. Is so Copilot works around the role base access control that you've been given. Yep. Okay. Whatever you can do in Azure is what Copilot can do as well. So there are specific things inside of Azure that you need a specific role for. That, and sometimes those roles require a little bit extra oomph than you would normally give to a specific person because it has to do something somewhere else. And so we have a concern around being stupid being the barrier, right? I mean, that's that's a thing. Like ignorance is the barrier. So if you don't know how to delete a VM in Azure, having the ability to delete a VM in Azure, there's still a barrier. You're not going to go and delete one because you don't know how, even if you've got the permissions to do so. However, Copilot does. So you don't have to necessarily know how anymore, right? So that resultant set of policies is very, very important there because you could give somebody access to go do a something. They could say, Copilot, hey, come on, you know me. What can I do here? <laughs> you can do quite a bit, pal. How about you go and see all that stuff over there? okay, I'll go do that. And then you do. So the barrier to entry now is like zero. So somebody can just use plain, simple English to do whatever the hell they want in their tenant. And I think that's going to be a little bit of a, a problem there. So Nick, I think that's actually one of those things that needs to be, yeah, it's like, how can you prevent Copilot from doing things that even though a user has been given access to shouldn't be doing? Yeah, I think going back, it's a bit like search, right? When when uh, search was first rolled out, search used to be really horrible, right? When search was first rolled out, people figured out, hey, like this thing is accessible to everyone, and uh, like they would search. People would usually search for their name, and in a past company I worked, this person they rolled out better search. The person went and searched, and he suddenly saw conversations he had with HR turning up in the search results. And apparently that SharePoint site or whatever that had that was always open, but no one knew it because <laughs> search didn't work well enough, but it was always open. If you knew, you could go and get to it. Yeah. And it's that same, same sort of thing. Exactly yeah, so, thing. Yeah. So, and you'll see different people in different reactions, right? Like some will go like the ostrich, oh, like shut off the search, shut off the search. All right. Mm -hmm. While the document is still open, their priority is shutting off the search um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you'll, you'll see others taking a more measured approach. So I think it's sort of that same similar learning curve mm. that everyone goes through. And for me personally, it's also been using it. Like we have search, but we might not search, use it well. Even with like, if you say Google search or Bing, 
if you use it, if you know how to use the search, you can find things faster than um, mm. others. And mm. in the same way with Copilot, True. like I had access to GitHub Copilot for a long time. I, I write a lot of code, but I never used it. But recently, I I sort of been training myself to ask questions there, and then I do the same thing on search and reading Stack Overflow and it's amazing like things i would spend like five ten minutes i just get it in like seconds so yeah, and, awesome. and it's like tailored to what it is i'm writing the code um and i'm finding i'm switching more and more to that but so it's it's something that you need to train yourself mm -hmm. and it's like even when security copilot and those things come it's going to be that and there will always be things where it doesn't work the way you expect and you need to rephrase your prompt um, and improve on that. It's we are all going to be learning this in the next year, two years as we mm. improve. But there's going to be a huge difference between people who know and use it this versus those who don't. Like mm. they're going to be a lot more productive and get things done versus those who like uh, are not using it or not utilizing it. Um, mm. It's going to be very interesting. I, I you know I do find it to be a an interesting conversation and an interesting challenge right because i can see the point of it's only as useful as you allow it to be because you know i mean a lot of us you, you know and I, to, that the example is, is is almost exactly how my experience with you know chat gpt for example first started right is i obviously i heard the, the buzz and you know um any conversation you have everyone's like well what does chat gpt say and I'm like, yeah, whatever guy I, I i got better things to do than than you know chat to a chatbot but i was i was working on some home automation thing um uh, a while mm. back and there was it was literally like an arduino sketch that i was trying to figure out right and I, and after no i just couldn't figure it out eventually i just thought you know what let's let's try this chat gpt thing and yeah within seconds it had kind of, I, yeah. it, it, it had sorted it out for me and, it, and that kind of woke me up to it but i do think there's also the danger of like folks who are reaching right people who are pretending to be specialists in a particular topic using that to augment skills that they don't have um instead well, of it being a, a you know a, a helping or a learning aid it, it being thing something is you, that you do get to notice it though like you know, my wife was interviewing some people for some positions a little while back, right? And you could see that that particular CV letter had been written by ChatGPT. Like you could see it like a mile away. You're like thinking, there's no chance this guy knows that English. Like hmm. no ways. It was just like so blatant. So I think hmm. as soon as, you know, like people... You, the people who know how to use chat GPT to augment mm. what it is that they're doing, mm. understand what it is that they're trying to do in the first place. So they know where the goalpost is. Mm. Somebody who, like you say, is reaching, they actually don't know where they're going to. There's mm. like no actual goalpost. They're just sort of like, okay, maybe I can pull this off. And they have no idea mm. what they're trying to get to in the first place. And mm. I think a lot of people sort of misunderstand the definition of a co-pilot is to be a co-pilot not mm. to be an autopilot. I mean, there's like yes. two very, very different things there, you know. Is that um, is that is that a, uh, a sort of an NDA announcement that maybe, you know, is, is coming? Because, <laughs> no. you know, we're, we're in the world of copilot. Is, is 2025 yeah. going to be the year of autopilot? Jeez, <laughs> oh, I, oh, I hope not. <laughs> I want to have an avatar called Clippy that does my job for me. <laughs> well, yeah, but you could, you could do that now. I mean, there was some dude who wrote a Clippy. That spoke mm. to Chat GPT. That was pretty cool. I mean, like this little guy here. This uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the. You remember Vector? Yes. He's shame. This poor guy. Yeah. Um, Anki, like they were moving from AWS to Azure, and it's literally taken like a year for them to do this. So some guy went and wrote an op open source version of his server kit, and then all you do now is you take his. Um, the API destination of where he was originally asking the questions to, mm -hmm. and you move it to chat GPT. So now when I ask him a question, all that's happening is that his, his speech interpreter is sending it through to chat GPT and then talking it straight back to me. So he's chat GPT now, which is so cool. <laughs> I mean, it's like know, an open really... source version of rabbit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly so right. I, I have a, I, I was, I've got a question just... for, for, for yeah. Meryl. A little bit down the the um, the security rabbit hole because it is a deep rabbit hole, and 
Uh, lately, Microsoft's been in the news for actually, for those of us who've ever been through a breach, it's the right reasons because we learn from breaches, right? As opposed, We're not to allowed to talk who, about this. Well, well, I am, so you can mute for a while. Okay. All right. <laughs> so the, the, the upside of a breach for any company is the learnings, right? And the most valuable CISO in the world is a CISO who's been through a breach and has had learnings. Now, we, we know that Midnight Blizzard took advantage of multi-tenant applications as well as permissions and specifically API permissions that were probably hard to document. And Meryl, you've done a shameless plug for your blog, a lovely set of articles around this, which seems strangely timeless, but we'll just ignore that. And I want to call out- And a tool now, two. and a tool. And a tool. <laughs> Yeah. So you've got one called Azure AD, multi-tenant app versus single-tenant app. Mm, that's not an Entra ID thing there. <clears throat> and of course, the Graph Permissions Explorer and an, a lovely tool that creates a beautiful spreadsheet. Now, thank you for this, by the way. Yes. <laughs> so one of the things that we grapple with, and particularly when we have large directories, is that there's many permissions and a lot of, oh, I didn't know there was an app in there from 2015. I wonder if that's still useful, right? And we, we spoke to a, a software vendor that wrote a tool around this who had a large enterprise customer that I'm not allowed to, to mention. They thought, let's just start disabling some things and the water pumps in their facility stopped working, <laughs> right? So do you mind just telling us about those three things, and thank you for them, by the way. Yeah, so credit to one of mine. So this script, it's not something new. We've uh, given this since 2018. Uh, one of, uh, he used to be a former CX, he's now a feature PM, Felipe. So he wrote the script in Azure AD PowerShell that basically gives you an export of all the apps and the permissions. Um, we do have that in the portal, but not in sort of a summarized way. Mm. Uh, so he did that in 2018. In 2020, some of my colleagues, we, after SolariGate, we did go, because that's what they did, right? With SolariGate, they got in and they were hiding in the clouds. They got into apps, created credentials, uh, and then you didn't even know, right? Because they were not even, they, they were like legitimate apps where they were adding um like credentials to them and then using that so it, you couldn't delete that app because that was like some of them were like microsoft first party apps uh, themselves that they added those to uh, be, because they compromised on-prem adfs mm -hmm. and got in so uh, this is something not, it's not new it's OAuth. it's the standard consent and at the end of the day every admin needs to be careful about what apps and what permissions they give um, and it's always been an educational experience. Mm -hmm. Like when I used to work in my past role before joining Microsoft, I used to always have to say no, no, because like lots of devs would just do the minimum needed to get stuff working. And um, they would ask for the most permission because then they don't need to keep coming back and asking for more permissions, right? So um, everyone obviously follows the easy route. And uh, as the admin for, of each tenant, you need to be aware of what the app is, whether you're going to give them that level of permission into your tenant, uh, because all they need is that app and a secret or a cert, they can access it from anywhere in the globe, right? If, if Even if an employee leaves, if they know that secret, they can still have access into the tenant. So, uh, and and it's, it's API. You can't say you can't have APIs because then there won't be any apps and you can't mm -hmm. do your work, right? So we need to have APIs and sure. the content model. So you do need to have, but it's the admin's responsibility to be very aware of who they're giving access to um, mm -hmm. in terms of the apps. We, we focus a lot on users and making sure, you know, users, MFA, mm -hmm. security, but apps are really important because some of those permissions you give it like across the board, right? Like uh, if you give like groups permission, uh, that app can read all the one-on-one -on -one chats, all of the chat messages that people are sending, uh, mm -hmm. all of that's visible. And you wouldn't mm -hmm. think a lot, but you like mm -hmm. that's what admins need to be aware of that. Um, 
yeah so th that tool what i wrote was just an improvement of what we did uh where we uh, i just made it a little bit more accessible improved the formatting mm -hmm. uh improved the performance as well on that like using some partial scripts because and red I, means bad right <laughs> Uh, red means bad, yes. Uh, so um, and that lets you view. But I think we, I need to have a few more categories. It's just high, medium, low now, which uh, mm. might not be enough. There are some that are very bad. So like mm. something like very high uh, would mm. be a better distinction. Critical is the <laughs> yes. critical customer. But I, you know, I think I think the point that that I'm hearing from you though, and this is something that I think we've talked about a, a fair bit on here, right? Is Everyone always goes to try and over, over engineer the solution to these problems. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, if you're doing the very basic things well and you're doing them right, you know, you're, you're protecting yourself, right? The Azure AD, Entra ID, app permissions, all that stuff is is it's the same. There has to be some hygiene, there has to be some life cycle, there has to be reviews and audits and all of these things done. You can't just go and create something, set it, forget it, and and, and expect that it's not going to come back and bite you some at some point in the future. And I think that's it's important that that folks that are in the in admin roles and that are responsible for tenants understand that right is you you because you're in the cloud doesn't mean you've gotten rid of housekeeping um housekeeping think, is more to be honest more it's actually important. worse dude yeah 100 yeah. it's worse it yeah i think it's worse in the cloud because you know yeah. on prem at least you had like a like a bubble around it you know yeah sort of like almost pyramid, yeah right? you, there was a bubble yeah. that you could sort of almost be sure that you know, you had this little safe space, whereas with cloud, it's just coming from all directions. Mm -hmm. It's even worse, yeah, for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. because, yeah, as an on-prem AD admin, you didn't really care, right? Your whole AD was mm -hmm. open to everyone on the network, mm -hmm. and you relied on the VPN, the network guys, to make sure they protected you. Yes. But in the cloud, you, especially after COVID, your mm -hmm. users and devices and IoT devices, they're going to be accessing from all over the globe. And guests. And, and guests mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So you as the admin need to be really aware of what apps you allow into your tenant and mm -hmm. uh, and and the users and what level of access they have and do those frequent reviews and remove those permissions. So mm -hmm. it's not something that Microsoft can do on your behalf because you like we can mm -hmm. turn off all apps, but then you won't be able to get any work done. So mm -hmm. it's a balance of like the vendor trusting the vendor who you work with making sure they are doing the right things as well um, and assessing what you give. And it, it goes two ways. You can't say no to everything as well because then mm -hmm. you're in your industry, maybe your comp competitor is more agile. Mm -hmm. Like they mm -hmm. move on to like mm -hmm. new tools like Copilot and ChatGPT and they are able to win more deals and do mm -hmm. stuff. Whereas mm -hmm. you're falling behind because you said, no, I'm not going to allow that mm -hmm. into my True. head. So it's always a balance and like mm. you need mm. to go in with your eyes mm. wide open and, uh, mm. when you when you do this meryl you have come from a a large enterprise background and you've been the administrator and could you talk to administrators who can't live in the gui because there's just too much stuff going on because to be fair you know Trying to do things 25 objects at a time doesn't scale in a large directory, especially when you've got um, thousands or even hundreds of thousands of, of, of objects, including guests and large tenants. But at the same time, you're struggling <clears throat> with a modernization of what can you do in PowerShell because we're moving away from one PowerShell provider, which was Azure AD, to this graph thing where I now have to think in terms of, oh, what does user.read mean? And do yes. I have to start learning again from scratch? Can you talk to those folks who, well, I'm just I'm just dying here. Where do I start? Right. Yeah. So um, yeah, Azure AD PowerShell was born before that. There used to be MS Online PowerShell, so there was already yes. like a, a curve. You went from MS Online PowerShell to Azure AD PowerShell, and it was very well loved. Like I loved it. I mm. I knew it so well. I didn't need to look up docs. I knew just to type get Azure AD user or get actually the application and it all worked um graph is slightly different because graph takes the but the one of the biggest problems with actually partial was it was always falling behind uh, so the functionality would come up first 
and then a few months or sometimes never the power shell commanders right like mm-hmm. i remember working um in one one area where we had to t- set up mfa and actually power shell didn't have a way to set the phone number uh for users so i'd sit and manually copy phone numbers in for like about 100 users it was in a, in a it was an emergency so i had to do that um and you didn't have those apis so to be able to give people that programmability we took the graph api and generate the powershell commandlet so every few weeks as the new apis drop you get the commandlet it might not be as polished as the azure powershell where admins like it had all the powershell features Uh, but it gave you the api so you could get going but yes there is no hiding the fact there's a, like a learning curve you need yeah. to because you are you need to put on the mindset of a developer not not the not an admin where you write one scenario based command and it does everything um you need to write like a dev like you to get a collection of objects add an item to the collection then patch it back and so it's it is a bit of a learning curve now graph partial team they are aware of that and they've been doing a lot to help improve that um and we we are also always looking at ways to uh, how we can make that better uh, at least for uh entra microsoft entra the partial folks from azure ad like they come that so we if you see we have like in teams in exchange on top of graph there is all, all also these other commandlets uh, powershell modules that sort of try to bridge that gap um and that's something uh, that we are looking at as well uh, but yeah so powershell will be is like you need to use that and uh, what i've do noticed is people are still um, not making that jump so it is a learning curve but once you get used to it i'm now equally comfortable with graph since i've been using it um now i'm more comfortable with the azure ad graph partial than the azure ad ones because it's just that the the muscle skills mm. and you know mm. you you get used to it after doing it um and I, like i want to actually start a series like a youtube series showing that because i still see people writing uh, the other day there was even a microsoft blog post that had like a like a 10 20 lines of code when they could have written it in one line mm-hmm. and so I didn't, i didn't reach out to them say because too. they mm-hmm. yeah so it was just mm-hmm. one get mg command all you had to do is say pipe and say all and instead of that they had written a whole like logic to page through all the results and go to the next page and mm-hmm. it was like 20 20 odd lines of code when mm-hmm. like just one line gave you mm-hmm. that um, old so habits you, die hard <laughs> exactly i yeah, used to like doing everything <laughs> at the low level and yeah that's something we need to improve on to get folks to move more to that you know fun so fun fact right is is um we on connect 365 so merrill i have a, a little gui app that you can run to basically connect to all of the, the the modules so if you have you know if you're trying to connect to exchange online and the azure ad module for example yeah. you can run my my script and it's a gui you just put in your username password and click a few buttons and it will launch those for you um and when i first i i have this thing this tool's been it's probably about 10 years old at this point probably even more right and i've been sort of carrying it carrying it over as the years go by we kind of update it whenever and um when i first when i first published it um to do more than just exchange um i specifically built it with the azure ad modules right we didn't use msol i used only azure ad and right. over the years i've had so many people write to me and say hey i love your tool but you don't have the msol mo- modules in module built in and i kept saying yeah. well you're supposed to move away from those because they're going to get deprecated but it's been 10 years right and the module yeah. still does exist and so i actually have built um msol into it now because i just i was getting so many requests from folks going hey this is helpful and then it just took one day where i was trying to do something myself for a customer and i i it like the the commandlet didn't exist in the azure ad module yeah. and i had to install msol and i was like okay that's it i'm doing this now this has been like 8 years of like it's being deprecated but it never did um but i wanted to ask you so we know so, um there is just in yeah, you on that one just on yeah. that so yes we we actually i'm working very closely with uh, uh steve who is my counterpart in the feature pm we are working on closing those gaps so a lot of those 
uh, even them saw some the APIs didn't exist over the yeah. last six months to 12 months. We've gone a lot and closed off all those gaps and we have them in Graph PowerShell. So yes, I'm Excellent. completely aware of the various <laughs> commandlets. And even when we had the commandlet, yeah. the way it returned, it didn't. Re it was missing some of the data that you found in MS Online. Um, yeah. But yeah, we've closed those gaps quite a lot. We've announced deprecation for Azure AD for like end of next month. Um, but yeah, like we are doing all that bits to like mm. complete and make sure that Graph will have all of the things that you need. And I think so ultimately, and I think for, for anyone who uses Connect365, you know, a little bit of roadmap, you heard it here first is, you know, right now I'm working on a, a couple of improvements, one that will take the MG modules so that you can actually use the Graph stuff and set it up and, and actually, you know, select your scopes and stuff through the GUI, right? Just to just to help folks. So that's happening. Um, and paste to clip paste from clipboard is is something that's uh that's that's coming as well to make it easier. But the real it's instead still of not compliance, I mean it's what? <laughs> paste to what do you from mean from clipboard. <laughs> no, your well, clipboard well, is well, compliant, <laughs> right? Clipboard with, with is your, not with compliant. Your, <laughs> no, I'm talking about your for for your password, right? Because because when you do the connection on the connection string on the module today, you can't pass the mm. password in. Um, and, yeah. and I'm working on some stuff where um, we want to store the credentials as profiles in the Windows Credential Manager and be able to automatically copy the password That's into cool. your clipboard so you can paste it in. And then once it's pasted, cool. we'll clear it out just to be compliant. Mr. Warren, thank you. Um, there we go. I'm the last person to talk about compliance. Jeez, I hate it but, so much. But to, to get away from 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 all of those uh, spoilers, um, Meryl, the question I actually uh, I had for you was, um, you talked about, and it's been mentioned, the deprecation of a bunch of PowerShell modules, right? Can you can you dig into that for us and just kind of set the record straight as to what's yep. going away and and when is it going away and what's going to happen when it goes away? Right. So I'll give you some history as well, like uh, a little bit of inside story on the back, like the backend APIs. So mm -hmm. we have graph and it's all on this new uh, endpoint that we have. The Azure AD graph, if you know, we deprecated Azure AD graph, which is sort of the older version of uh, Microsoft graph, not, like, not necessarily Microsoft graph. It's what we called uh, the Azure AD APIs. And they were built on a, they're running on a platform that's old, we've moved all of the code and graph on to like a newer platform which is a lot more performant all of our investments are in there all of the new security features like continuous access evaluation um even fido to support etc didn't exist for the old azure partial um so we had this new api and that's where we're investing like you can do all the fancy search and filters when you query devices users you can't do any of that in the old API because it was like a legacy one. Um, the architecture was old, so we have this new one. So we want to eventually shut down Azure AD Graph and the PowerShell modules use those old Graph API endpoints. And the, the whole reason is it's less secure. It has like, it's two things for us to maintain. And that's the reason behind deprecating it. Uh, now, why we we do give usually a, like a two year timeline, and that's what we've done. We've extended it quite a bit because one of the biggest things is, as you mentioned, those parity, right? Like you still can do things in MS Online today. You can, I would, I can say, I think it's less than five things that you can do on MS Online that you can't do in Microsoft Graph. So we've been working a lot on closing that gap, and that's one reason we couldn't sort of completely shut them down. Um, so that's the thinking behind like moving away from those and moving it in all of that into Microsoft Graph. So it lets us like move forward a lot more faster and it's a better platform, less throttling. Uh, you Your APIs will be like, uh, you can get a lot more done with that call things in parallel, uh, which I did with my new script, you know, to pull down all the service principle, like, I did it to run with like 10 threads in parallel with in partial and you can tweak and just pass in and say like go go 20 threads or depending on the number of cores you have. Mm -hmm. um, so graph can graph is much better at returning those mm -hmm. than the older APIs and that performance. So that's the the story behind why we want to move away from that. Uh, it's less secure. 
one of the other big issues is Azure PowerShell is pre-consented to all of the permissions. And uh, a lot of the, the bad guys use that app because it already has those permissions mm. in there. Um, whereas with Microsoft Graph, you need as the admin to consent and mm. you need to select who you want to allow. So th th those are all the, the reasons behind why we want folks to move off as JD PowerShell into Graph. And, and so that's, that. we're, we're talking about the AAD um, module and we're talking about MSOL as well. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Both. And, and is it something like six weeks away for that? Five, six weeks, I think, before that uh, gets deprecated? Yeah, so this we will be stopping. So we are not retiring it. So it's not okay. like the APIs are not going to be turned off. It's going to be deprecated. So the support won't be there. So if you okay. call an API and it's not working, if you call help call Microsoft support, they'll say do it with Microsoft Graph. Uh, okay. So that's what's happening. Retirement where we shut down the endpoints that will come later. Hmm. Of course, we can't shut it down until we have like full yeah. clarity. Um, so that's that will that's definitely that. This is like the first phase of uh, okay. getting to that. Hmm. Yeah, I like that you're know. calling out that the the bad guys are often more knowledgeable than our administrators who are trying to keep things secure, right? That's always the I case. Mean, that's their life, right? They are trying to find ways in, um, and <laughs> they. They they know a lot, and um, I'm glad some people like um, the AD internals, Dr. Nestori mm. Cinema. He's now with us at Microsoft. Oh, um I so, didn't know that. Yes, he joined. Uh, so he like it's good to have people like him in Microsoft mm. to help you know drive that message as well. Mm. I'd like to ask you, Meryl, since you are such a treasure trove of knowledge, <laughs> who else is out there? who does what you do, because Intra ID is obviously a large product and there's many silos within that. But who else should the community be following in order to learn and to, to gain breadth in Intra ID? So Intra ID, uh, there are quite a lot of folks I follow uh, from a security perspective. Um, there are people who practice them. So people who come to my mind immediately are Nathan McNulty. He is a really good person on Twitter to follow. On LinkedIn, there is Eric Manon. Um, he has some really good, uh, brings in a lot of good experience on like why you should be shutting down your on-prem yes. AD. Uh, he's, yes. he's had some excellent posts recently. Um, and that's uh, like, those are really two from like two ends of uh, the people that you should follow. Um, I have my own, um, my in my team jeff jeff casimir he's i think jeff tech uh on twitter so he he's there as well uh posting and sharing on twitter and even other communities so he is also a good person to follow on intra id uh, of course i think all everyone will know rod uh rod trent so he he does a mm -hmm. lot on the sentinel and all of the other security side of things he has his own Sentinel newsletter. He was like one of the inspirations for me starting my newsletter as well. Um, so on security side, it, it'll be good to, like he's a good person to follow and keep on top of things. He talks a lot about AI as well now. So hmm. that'll be good. So uh, slight, slightly, well, I guess topical, but um, I, I just a little bit outside the realm of, of following in community. Um, what do you tell folks that organizations that are still running ADFS? And, and, you know, I honestly, I have almost forgotten about ADFS, that it was even a thing, right? <laughs> and I know, so, you know, way back, you know, way back when, when we were both better looking, Nick and I um, and Warren, we did a very long recording with the with the Microsoft folks in New York. Um, and I think that day we recorded something like five hours with the content where we were working with yeah. the documentation team and we went through all of these scenarios, um, you know, AD, AD Sync, or do you want, you know, a federation with ADFS, stuff like that? I mean, this was probably a good six, five, six years ago now. Mm -hmm. But I, I pretty much have forgotten that ADFS was even a thing at this point, right? Um, so uh, many people still use it, hey? Exactly. Like, I, lately, I've been I've been doing, you know, a lot of work, um, on-prem work with customers that have very large ADs, right? And, and the chickens are coming home to roost in a lot of these active directories. And a lot of organizations are kind of waking up to the realization that, hang on, we may have 
you know, conditional access and MFA and all of this cool stuff in our in, in our online environment, well, we have this big gaping hole on prem here with this old yeah. creaky Active Directory that we haven't done anything on for like the last ten years. Um, and so, yeah, ADFS is something that I've been seeing again, um, and I was I was wondering like what the current or the the, the current thinking from Microsoft is as, as far as what are we telling customers about ADFS and those that are still running ADFS? Is there a, a message to them? Oh, yes. Get rid of it. <laughs> Get rid of it. Yeah, shut, <laughs> shut it down. <laughs> no, right. And uh, I personally, I work with customers, some large enterprise customers in Australia. Uh, I've helped all of them migrate off ADFS and they've shut down their servers and uh, save heaps of money. Heaps of mm -hmm. admin time has been freed up. Uh, they're more secure now with just having the cloud, like not having to patch and maintain. Mm -hmm. um, the cost savings are huge, like because they need to keep upgrading, right? Windows Server, mm -hmm. like one customer was like a few, like a few million dollars to like upgrade all their mm -hmm. servers and infrastructure, uh, like from resourcing all of that. Uh, they just said, let's let's move it because we've been working to close that gap and. Like last, not last year, the year before, the one of the Ignite sessions I did was on migrating off ADFS. Uh, mm. We've done a lot of work. There was a, there were lots of gaps uh, in when it came to SAML and claims, mm. and mm. you could do things in ADFS you couldn't do in uh, Intra ID. But we've closed all of that. And at this Ignite, we actually launched a new tool that lets you uh, run, uh, like you in, install the Connect Health. It'll help you migrate your apps as well. So it'll give you all the ADFS apps and let you create them in um, Entry ID easily. That's so cool. it reduces that pain mm. of the migration. But yeah, it's a project you need to invest in and do. But once you do it, like it's a huge relief to shut down those mm. servers. There won't be any outages caused by something on-prem. Uh, your on-prem AD goes down. It's still not an issue because you'll mm. have uh, mm. users continue to be able to use Teams and SharePoint and continue. You say that, job. but I hate to to point out, and I've got customers who've pointed their shaking fingers at me saying, Intra ID and <laughs> beforehand, before the rebranding, Azure AD has suffered some global failures. And how do we maintain four nines as a business when we outsource ourselves completely to a another global directory? And, and I, I get that that's a different discussion, but customers feel that at least ADFS is in their control. So that's a good track record, right? Like I would ask, challenge anyone who has an ADFS, go look at your uptime and look at uh, Azure AD, Entra ID uptime for the last three years. Like the last global... Yeah, and how many of them were caused by years. like a, a natural disaster, like a hurricane? <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sorry. so we uh, we haven't had an outage, a global outage at all. We've moved to a new, the last outage, I think, was at least like three three years ago, um, 2020, uh, no, not even 2020, 2021. So we moved to a whole cell-based architecture. So even if there is an outage, it's going to be only like one data center. And we've done a lot of work on resiliency. Uh, we have a new backup service that's running. So even if there's an outage, because even for Microsoft, right? If there's an outage, you can't use Teams. Mm. That's when, like, Satya goes, like, what's happening? <laughs> and, um, like, Teams should be available and running all the time, right? Mm. And mm. we've set up so many uh, things there where uh, we have a new backup service as well. So even if Entride is down, your apps will continue working because we issue tokens from that backup service. So... Uh, like my challenge is we have the uh, stats online. We give a lot of information now. Uh, if you go in the intra portal, we give you your tenant specific outage information. So it doesn't even need to be global. We give you for your tenant, for your region, how long uh, there was an outage. Um, look at that stat. Look at your own ADFS stats. And then, you know, you'll, you'll come to the realization like as to who can uh, manage and keep things up and running over time. Mm. That's fair. That's my challenge and homework to anyone who says, uh, you know, you can have a better ADFS uptime. <laughs> That's completely so, fair. So, I love look, that. I think, I think I too. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, of, of homework, I think before we, we all run off and do that homework, um, Meryl, what what sort of passing thoughts or closing thoughts would you like to, to kind of leave the, 
the audience with, right? Is there anything you want to plug? I know you've mentioned your 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 newsletter, and for those who kind of missed it up on the the, the top of the show, uh, Intro News is the newsletter. Go and subscribe. Um, fantastic stuff. I think it's uh, edition thirty or number thirty this week. Um, uh, so really good stuff on there. Um, anything else? You've obviously you've got a myriad of tools available um, that are that are really cool cool things. I don't know if you want to kind of run through some of those or, or plug them, but anything you'd like to plug for for the audience would be great. Yes, so I'm just started my YouTube channel. So if you and I try to share like uh, videos and of new things. So if you want to learn more about graph and enter ID and uh, stuff related to that, feel free to subscribe. Like that's my new interest, but I do post on LinkedIn and Twitter mm -hmm. as well. Um, so my whole thing with what I try to share is try to make it easy to consume and digestible. Like there are big, the Microsoft Learn docs are excellent. People mm -hmm. just don't have the time to consume them. Like mm -hmm. uh, unless you are doing a project and you are knee deep in it and you need to know the ins and out, then you go to the docs. Uh, mm -hmm. But for you to just, you know, expand your knowledge on what's happening, what's uh, what's new, so you can use that in the next project or the challenge that comes mm -hmm. up. Um, so my goal is to just sort of simplify that uh, and let you grasp things in like 30 seconds to one minute Mm -hmm. um and that's that's what i i try to do that's great um, yeah, that's like so, that's enough for a short that's like a youtube short mm -hmm. almost right 30 yes, seconds yeah like one a youtube, minute, short, YouTube short and video. Yeah. exactly yeah so that's what i'm trying to do so you can you know call micro learning so you can mm -hmm. be consuming stuff but also learn while you're doing that while just doom scrolling <laughs> yes yes your, your infographics that you create are just exceptional Beautiful. they really do they, they're, they're very pretty to look at but they really do pack a lot of information in in that little sort of small bit of space mm. which is which is great yes and like i i get the inspiration from the customers i work with like they go like mm. this doesn't make sense help me understand yes. so i mm. tell them and then i think like this is will be a nice nugget of information mm -hmm. to share mm. with folks and I, I, i'd like to ask you a quick question if i may but before we close yeah. and um or a comment and then a question so one of the things that's very much missing in docs or learn is the voice of the architect so here's a concept but how do i apply it and i like that that's coming through in in your learnings so for people who want to be like you and a lot of our guests have got this massive imposter syndrome that's like why does anyone want to be like me but actually what you're doing very successfully is building your technical brand and how do you structure your day in the busy day that you have that other people can emulate to generate content consistently and be a consistent voice and a brand in the niche that they want to choose yes so uh, when i started out i just my whole thing was i'll share one tip a week like i didn't try to stretch myself i was like every week i'll share one tip and you might find it valuable and that's the like you don't might try to make it like really hard like you'll be frustrated um and i didn't do all these pretty graphics and stuff at the beginning it was just like a, a post right like we all learn things and one of the biggest other thing that we worry about is what will someone think of me will i say the wrong mm. thing and uh, if you do that you'll never start right you'll never begin or <laughs> take your first step um and people know so much like i learned so much from someone who just replies in a comment or replies in a reddit post there's so much wealth in there some of my blog posts i someone replied in a comment i take that and i make it into a post because like mm -hmm. that's a nugget of information uh, that like maybe i learned from just that post right so a um, lot of people have the knowledge and i really want more people to like share that i'm doing it for entry but i would love more people to do for like even entry is so big um, mm -hmm. But even on Azure and all of these other things, like people are really looking for content to like learn. Like we we are fed up with looking at dancing pictures and <laughs> that's such a great way of looking at it. Hey, such a great way of looking at it because lately, whenever I look at Twitter at the moment, all I'm seeing is just like doomsday, Elon mm -hmm. Musk talking about somebody yes. doing something or Joe Biden or whatever the case be is. And it's so refreshing to see somebody actually welcoming discussions on their topics. Mm, it's like, come mm. say something nice so that it will yeah, help me yeah. and you. 
Uh, I love that. Thank you, Meryl. Yeah, I do. So what I've done with my Twitter and the other feeds is I've actually, when I get posts that I don't want, I actually unfollow. Like I fo follow a lot of people. And then mm. when I see things that I don't like, I sort of Narrow just it down. unfollow. Now yeah. my Twitter feeds, it's mostly tech stuff that I see. Mm. And so yeah. it's you, like you see what you want. So even with TikTok and the others, I was just telling someone yesterday, there's a hashtag tech talk, tech talk. And oh, if yeah. you start following that, You'll actually be following people to teach you. Like I learned a lot about nice. Copilot and GitHub and uh, Code, and there are some Azure uh, content as well. People who are making, but yeah, if it, it 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 feeds you more of what you watch, and mm. it's up to you to choose. It's just an algorithm, right? Like yeah, you you decide what you want to see, and it's very wise. You need it for what you want. <laughs> <laughs> that's the name of the show <laughs> it's an algorithm you see what you want to see <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what a great show i just want to say yeah. thank you thank to meryl you. it's lovely having warren back and chris always a pleasure meryl i hope that we get to have you on another episode there's so much to talk about and Absolutely. many people that we've mentioned especially your newsletter will include that in in the show notes and from us Thank you so much, and we look forward to having you back again. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me. It's been like I didn't even notice the time flies so fast, and we've been talking about so many different things, mm. <laughs> not just all interest. So thanks so much for such an interesting conversation. Thank you.